Okay. Well, welcome to the uh, Royal Society. I'm John Scahill. I'm the Biological Secretary. I have some uh, uh, housekeeping things before I introduce tonight's speaker. Uh, if there's a fire, you go out there or at the back. And uh, please switch off your uh, telephones. I think that's all. Um, tonight's lecture is the Francis Crick Lecture. It was endowed by Sidney Brenner in honor of Crick in uh, 2003. Uh, tonight's speaker is Duncan Odom from Cambridge University and the Cancer Research UK Institute in Cambridge. Duncan graduated in uh, bio-inorganic chemistry in Caltech and then went to uh, MIT, the Whitehead Institute, where he started his work on genomics and developed procedures for looking at transcription in uh, a genomic sense. He's continued doing that in relation to uh, evolution in Cambridge and he now also has a joint appointment with the Sanger Institute. Tonight his talk is on genetic control and the mammalian radiation. Duncan. Thank you. So I'd like to thank Shankar for nominating me for this and to the Royal Society for my uh, appointment uh, to give the Francis Crick Lecture. Can everyone in the back hear me cle clearly? Okay. Did I hear a no? <laughs> yes. You can't. All right. I'll, I'll raise it. I hope I don't barrel you guys out. Um, so my story uh, starts not here, which is our current world, but the story, my story, our story that we'll be going through tonight starts here 66 million years ago. At this moment in Earth history, mammals did not rule the Earth. The Earth was dominated by giant reptiles as the megafauna. And mammals were basically, you might have noticed right here, this little insectivore running around at the feet of the giant herbivores. We got our big break when a 12 kilometer asteroid slammed into the Yucatan Peninsula, leaving a 180 kilometer mile wide crater and exterminating about 80% of the species of the planet, leaving lots of empty ecological niches that mammals radiated into, thus the title of my talk. So, one of the few survivors of this catastrophic, cat catastrophic event was uh, the Ur placental. It doesn't have a name, it's a hypothetical. Um, it has a common anatomy with all vertebrates. It was probably an insectivore. It was probably a forager, because that's about the only thing that could survive when there's no photosynthesis for 10 years. And in the last 66 million years, it's, it's radiated quite widely. We now have tens of thousands of species of mammals. Now, Interestingly, 40% of those are still just, you know, ground-dwelling insectivores and scavengers like rats and mice. But among the other things it's radiated into includes some of the most magnificent creatures that have ever been on the planet, including uh, things like the blue whale and says whale, these giant uh, marine mammals that weigh tens of tons, um, highly sleek, uh, incredibly fast, predators that are their cousins. Uh, you get giant herbivores with, with thick armored skin and, and plating for defense. All this from a, a one kilogram insectivore. And of course, flying mammals. How cool is that? They reinvented it. So all of these species have shared anatomy. And um, what I'm going to talk to you about is how there's also a very modest evolution among the protein coding genes. Now, the one thing I want to remind you of, and this came to my attention when I was doing the research for this talk, is that all of these species, in, in a way, have been seen before on this planet. And what happened was a convergence event, where a lot of the ecological niches, we just simply 
the, the original mammal simply radiated to fill that slot. So this is pretty cool. And the last few minutes of my talk, I'm going to talk to you about the recent work that we've done to try to understand the molecular underpinnings of this radiation event. All right, but for the moment, let's talk about what a mammal is. So a typical mammal has about 30 trillion cells, 500 different cell types, 3 billion bases in its genome. That's a huge number, by the way. And 20 to 40 chromosomes. So that, the, the, that, that 3 billion bases is actually broken into about 20 pieces, so it's a little bit more manageable. And there's about 25,000 genes in this genome. OK, so let's take a typical mammal as an example. And that would be your speaker in 1994. Unfortunately, things have changed a little. I did not Photoshop this, nor was I wearing a wig. Um, if you took a tissue, now how, is all, how are all of these things organized in a mammal? If you took a random tissue, say liver, you'll be hearing a lot about liver tonight, and you zoom in on its microscopic structure so that you can see individual cells, um, you'll see that they're nicely organized. Um, and within each cell, there is a nucleus where there's as I said, the chromosomes are sub-packages of the 3 billion bases. And the 3 billion bases are packaged into these little sub-pieces. And if you unwound that, so if you just stretched it out until you eventually got down to the double helix that was made so famous by Watson and Crick, and among others, um, you would actually have just a series of A's, T's, G's, and C's that coded for all the information that's required to synthesize whatever mammal that came from. OK, so let's, let's look more closely at the DNA sequence for a moment. Because this is what I'm going to be talking about a lot. This was just kind of explaining where it fits within a mammal. Every single cell has exactly the same genome, but all the different tissues are different. And again, I will come back to that to try to set up the key questions that I answer in just a couple of slides in the middle. All right, so taking DNA. DNA is actually, and I'm going to simplify here, in fact, in fact, the next 10 slides summarize about 40 years worth of work that won somewhere between six to eight Nobel Prizes. And I'm going to butcher everything just to strip it down to the pieces that you need to understand to understand what I'm about to present. So my apologies to all of the, my, of the greats who pre predecessed me um, that are rolling in their graves. So roughly speaking, DNA can be broken into sort of two different categories. There's protein coding genes and other. Um, and one very serious line of research in the 40s, 50s, and 60s was trying to understand how these bases coded for proteins. Um, and it turns out that it's a very simple decoder, almost like the rings that you get uh, in, in a cereal box. Uh, three of these letters define which protein amino acid is being coded for in each one of these, all right? So you can, I've restructured this just to show the triplets here a little bit more clearly. And this ATG codes for methionine, this CCT codes for phenylalanine, and so on. And then these pieces, when the cell is reading them, it will sit there and do Lego blocks to build the protein. That's the way to think about it. And these instructions are very hardwired. This goes all the way down to E. coli. For the most part, this genetic code is as old as life itself. All right. And here's something important. In mammals, this is only 1% of the DNA content. 99% is other. And again, I, I'm aware that I'm ignoring many different categories of non-coding RNAs, but, but for the moment, just bear with me. OK, so coming back to this, the, as I said, this triplet is hard. It's very, it, it's very set. You cannot change these without trashing the protein that it codes for, which means that it's under very, very strong selective pressures to be maintained as what it is. What this means is that in the earliest sequencing of other species besides human, the first thing that we were able to do is to say, aha, check it out. There they are. And they're largely identical all the way through. Mouse, human, dog, opossum, you name it. You get largely the same triplet codes. There's a little bit of variance in the third position, which I've shown here as a couple of gray ones, one there, 
and one here. But for the most part, it's very hardwired. All right. And these proteins uh, that come off of this, um, oh yeah, so I, I want to emphasize this. Most mammals have almost identical protein coding genes. So ultimately what makes us different than a Say's whale is just the non-coding RNA. All right? So these protein coding genes are expressed in different tissues. I'm showing here a genetic loss. So I'm showing the DNA now as a bar, and I've done little uh, stripe symbols for a protein coding gene called ApoA2. And this is a protein coding gene called TOM40L, which is right downstream of it. Now, this is the same genetic sequence I showed you before, and that, that point right there where the protein starts is that point right there, all right? So I've just zoomed it, I've sort of pulled back away so that you can see the overview of the region around it of about 100 kilobases. So in liver, which I've shown colored, so this is the liver cell here in red on the bottom. With liver, you get, I've, I've colored it red, and ApoA2 is highly expressed. And TOM40L is not. All right, if you went to a different tissue, you'd see a different pattern. So TOM40L is perhaps expressed in brain, but not in liver. Now, this is not mutually completely exclusive. In other words, you don't have, you know, brain might not be the only cell type that TOM40L is expressed in. It might be expressed in testes, for example. And, you know, brain and testes co-expression is quite common. Um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I try to make it entertaining. Um, so so let's, let's talk about how this, the nucleus of the liver knows to make ApoA2 into a protein. All right? Just for a second. Because it's, it's, it's paradigmatic for all of the cell types. So ApoA2, for example, probably has nearby a regulatory region, which we call an enhancer. And enhancers are regions where you have lots of um, pro other proteins. So ApoA2 is a protein. Of all the proteins expressed in the liver, some of them are transcription factors. And this is a special word. It means uh, a DNA binding protein which activates transcription. And I'll show this in just a second. So enhancers um, are hot spots for binding of these proteins. Um, and I'm going to talk about that enhancers near the end of my talk. We have methods for identifying these genome-wide. And we also have methods for identifying transcription factors genome-wide that bind to very, very small sequences. So enhancers are a little bit bigger. They're about 500 bases. And transcription factors, the protein binding DNAs, bind to smaller sequences. All right? Um, so when a transcription factor binds in a specific cell type, then it activates nearby genes, which are then transcribed in that cell. And if CEBP alpha, for example, is not present in brain, this is not going to be expressed in brain. Bang. So there's a special collection of these proteins in every cell type. And they're highly conserved through evolution. These proteins are, as well as these proteins. So these, these circuits, the overall form of the circuit is very highly conserved. And of course, what holds true for liver holds true for other cells. So if you have brain and TOM40L is expressed in brain, there's probably a brain-specific transcription factor bound nearby, which is activating its gene expression. All right? All right. Uh, so one of the first things that um, we collectively as a field uh, did when we started sequencing species besides humans was to say, all right, we've got this really, really powerful amino acid code for decoding what these bases mean. Can we find a similar code in here to decode what the instructions are? And this is a perfectly reasonable approach, all right? And in the first instance, what folks said was, let's look for places where the sequences are the same because those must be special. Because maybe, maybe, those are where transcription factors bind and activate this gene. Do you guys see this as a reasonable extrapolation of the genetic code into, so of the amino acid code into a regulatory code? All right, and it is very reasonable. 
The, but it has a number of knock-on implications and underlying assumptions. And I'm going to show you those right here. The assumption is, if you do your experiment in mouse, but you want to understand human, so you see that the mouse sequence is the same as the human sequence, you're assuming that that mouse transcription factor will, will bind the human in the same place, and does bind the human in the same place to apply that selective pressure. So this is what it looks like if you just blew it out, and you said, in each species, I'm going to do it, I'm going to write it out separately. Nobody ever does this. They just say, oh yeah, the sequences are conserved. Okay, whoa, what does that mean? It means you're assuming this. And again, let me emphasize, this is a, on the first pass analysis, a reasonable assumption, but it is an untested assumption. All right, this has led us to, to curses which still confound me to this day. Um, there has been assumptions that most transcription factor binding, especially near functional targets, will be conserved, and that experiments in gene regulation to try to understand which of these DNA binding transcription factors control which genes, that these can be done in any old species that you happen to have that's really convenient to manipulate, well, because, you know, you can infer it to the human because the sequences are conserved. All right? Um, and this, the first ex experiments, just to give you a, a quick backstory on this, the first experiments that, that I ever did in collaboration at the time with um, Robin Dowell and Dave Gifford at MIT, um, on, and, and, and uh, sorry, Ernest Frankel, um, on, on this subject, uh, Robin Dowell's husband was a uh, graphic design artist, and he said, so, so what are you guys doing again? And we explained it, and he was like, oh, so I got a great image for that. So he made this for us. That's his website. So the reason I'm standing in front of you is that um, I'm ornery enough to actually directly test these kinds of assumptions. Um, my lab, and I'm going to summarize about 15 or papers, uh, some of which were from my lab, some of which were from others, in just a couple of slides. Um, and what we did was we essentially tested this hypothesis. Uh, we, this was not possible until very, very recently. Ten years ago, when I first started trying to do this kind of experiment, uh, we had very low throughput assays that really didn't give you a quantitative understanding on a genome-wide basis. And I'm not going to give a talk about next generation sequencing, but about seven, eight years ago, um, high throughput sequencers came on the market which have allowed us to interrogate transcription factor binding like this, not just at small regions, but across the whole three billion bases of the genome. Quick, cheap, and easy. Um, so that was, a, that was a key breakthrough which allowed the experiments that I'm about to show you. Um, we have very strong links. Oh, these experiments demand postmortem tissue. So uh, generally, uh, after, an, uh, after death, you can get the tissues and then immediately freeze them and use them later in experiments. Um, and so we have very strong links to uh, Addenbrooke's Hospital, and before that we had links to clinics in, in Boston, Massachusetts, um, and we have uh, institutional authorization to get informed consent to get human livers from research patients to allow us to look at this kind of thing. Um, of course, mice and rats are the most widely used organisms for doing any biological research, and these tissues are very readily available. And Cambridge has a fantastic vet school, so we can get dog tissues very easily from dog hospital. Um, so the experiment is very straightforward. You map the transcription factor genome-wide, and then you compare. And I am burying a staggering amount of work of our computational collaborators as well as our own analyses in that simple statement. Um, the tissue we use for this is liver for a number of very straightforward reasons. Liver is overwhelmingly hepatocytes. So in a way, um, we're all just walking tissue culture hoods for hepatocytes because it's, it's just all in one tissue and it's very clean. Um, typical vertebrates are 5% or more liver because liver controls blood physiology and detoxification and meta metabolic functions. Um, it's a very homogeneous tissue. It's very easy to isolate. Um, for the same reason, for these reasons, it's been very heavily investigated. And some of the first transcription factors that were identified in human and mammalian systems were done from liver, actually, for exactly the same reasons. 
Um, it has obvious biomedical relevance for those of you that are going to the pub afterwards. You need your liver to take care of the beers that you drink. Um, and as I said before, the transcription factors and the protein binders that do that create all of this are highly conserved from us all the way down to fish. So anything in between, we're going to be good to go. So the kinds of experiments that my lab did, um, I've, I've drawn a very simplified example in the next couple of slides and pretty much reveals everything that I need to tell you. So what I'm showing here is signal from the transcription factor CEBP alpha in human liver. I've drawn the genome tracks here as the same kind of thing you've seen before with the names of the genes underneath it. All right, so this is APOA2. APOA2, when you knock out this transcription factor and then you ask what happens to gene expression, APOA2 is one of the genes which goes down. So it's what's called a direct target gene. That means that these two binding events are probably functional. They probably activate this gene. Okay. So, oh, and also APOA2 is very highly expressed in every species that we've ever looked at in the liver. So we repeated this experiment for mouse and dog. And the very simple thing that you're going to ask is, are these binding sites in the same location or are they different? And it turns out that in mouse and in dog, they're largely different. And this is your best case scenario because APOA2 is a direct target gene. All right? If you have binding sites that are not near target genes, you, know, you, you have even less confidence that something's going to be conserved. You only have one which is maybe in the same rough location syntenically, which means uh, the same location between the two different genomes. OK, so more globally, what my laboratory has reported um, is that only about 8% of the time is a transcription factor in the same place between mouse and human, which I'm showing here is 8%. And 92% of the time, it's not in the same location. Now, sometimes this can just move a couple of thousand bases, and maybe it does the same thing. That's not what I'm mentioning. What I'm emphasizing in this particular observation is that most of the time, it's not in the same place, which kind of challenges the assumptions of the sequence conservation indicating functional conservation. OK. And so, human, uh, so humans comparison to human, of course, is, I'm just calling it 100%, um, 8% between mouse and human. And because we had dog, we were able to actually confirm the 8% with a species which had diverged from human just as much as mouse, but in a completely different lineage. So all three of these are about 80, 65 to 80 million years separated. Monodelphus, which is this little symbol right here, is a, a, a marsupial. And marsupials are an unusual kind of mammal because they separated 100 million years before those a that asteroid hit the planet. So they're actually a completely separate form of mammal that, consistent with them being about twice as far away as mouse and dog, you get only about 5% overlap. And by the time you get to chicken, almost nothing is left. OK, so that underlying assumption, is sometimes it's right, but mostly it's not. And so we have to be cautious when we use sequence conservation to try to reveal function. And ultimately, it was these results and related ones, which is the reason I'm standing in front of you now. But now I'm going to tell you stuff that we're currently working on, um, and because I think it's really cool. And I hope you do too. So I, I wanted to take this even further. I, I wanted to try to understand the breadth and diversity of regulation that happens across all mammalian space. And this is an ambitious vision. Basically, I wanted to sample all of the different clades of mammals that we could get our hands on in an ethical way um, to try to look at what happens with enhancer evolution. Because we already know that protein coding genes um, are very highly conserved. So, we wanted to look at the divergent gene regulation. OK, what I'm going to tell you about is a story about the enhancers. So the previous stuff I've talked to you about is the, is the transcription factors, which target smaller sequences. I'm going to zoom out just a tiny bit and go after enhancers. I'm not going to explain why, but there are technical reasons for this um, about the kinds of experiments that you can do with the kinds of tissues that we had. 
but just trust me that it's going to be a cool story anyway. All right, so in an ideal world, what would you have? Right? So that was what we started with. Your desired criteria is that you would want species that were, that were separated at a very deep level. You don't want closely related species like um, mouse and rat necessarily because those are, you're not going to get a lot of changes between like mouse and rat or different species of mice. You want something where like dog to human or mouse to human where you have a deep uh, divergence depth because then you have lots of time to accumulate changes along lots of different lineages. All right? Um, you would want different kinds of mammals. You would want carnivores, rodents, maybe marsupials, like I described. Those predate this impact event, which probably triggered a lot of the radiation that we have now. Um, and for my own personal curiosity, I, I, I really, really wanted to get examples of the extremes of mammalian evolution, the body types, the phenotypes that are the most shocking when you see them. Um, whales, dolphins, Tasmanian devils. I thought those were super cool. Naked mole rat. And I'll explain a little bit more about these in just a slide or two. So the strategy is very straightforward. And that's to just map those 500 base pair enhancer regions and then compare them between different species. How often are they conserved? How often are they lineage specific? So where, how often do you get um, just the, the rodents, for example, sharing it, which means that it was one of these common ancestors down there that had it. How often do you get lineage specific that's only in one lineage and therefore species specific? So th these are very simple questions. They're discovery-based questions. They are not really hypothesis-based questions, but they're the first step, step to new understanding. Okay, so human, I've explained, Mouse and rats, that's easy to get. Vet schools can give us a lot of stuff, but where do we get these other species? Where do you get a, where do you get a naked mole rat from? All right, so I'm gonna give you four examples of the kinds of um, research that we had to do before we could do research in terms of getting these tissues. So two of them are trickier, and that's says whale and Tasmanian devil, so I'm gonna start with naked mole rat and cow. So it's easy to get a lot of species from slaughterhouses that we, we eat a lot of animals. And so getting organs is fairly straightforward. Research colonies often look at specific species because of very, very interesting biomedical phenotypes. Um, for example, the naked mole rat does not get cancer. And it is so long lived for its size that if we were the same longevity for our size, we would live 5,000 years. I think that's interesting. I think that's fascinating. And other people do too, which is why people have already set these things up and have banked their tissues, which we can then access. And, you know, as I said before, for the whale, that is a giant marine mammal. And it is a huge challenge. How do you get tissues from something like this? Amazing. And let me remind you, that came from that. So that's the motivation, right? Now, again, let me emphasize how, can, can, how did we solve this problem? Well, it turns out it was far simpler than you might imagine. <laughs> the British government, at, along with the um, devolved Welsh and Scottish governments, fund the Cetacean Strandings Investigation Program. They send a veterinarian out to all the major strandings to do postmortems. So I called them and I said, pretty please, can you give us a cup of liver. <laughs> so we were able to get say's whale and a species of dolphin and a species of porpoise from this source. Now, the last one is super cool. Um, my friend Liz Murchison uh, works on Tasmanian devil because it has transmissible cancers. That means I have, they, they get these, these mouth cancers. When they bite each other, they, they pass that cancer on to their neighbor. Or if you think about it, 
that's really scary, right? So we want to understand this, um, as does she. Well, she explained to me that the only place that you can get tissues from is a bank of tissues from the Copenhagen Zoo, which has the only breeding colony for these in all of Europe. Awesome. I contacted them. We contacted them, sorry. And they have great conservation and research programs, and they were glad to donate tissues towards this goal. So, we have our tissues, we have our technology. What are the high-level results from this? When you do the experiment and you ask how many through all 20 mammals that we looked at are conserved, turns out there's only about 400. A little bit under. That's it. And this is the part that excited me the most. When you ask how many of them are species-specific and found in only one species, whichever that species is, because human does not have to be the point here. You can rotate any species up to the top, right, and compare and identify the species-specific ones. Turns out there's about 12,000 typically, 10 to 14,000 in a typical mammal. Now, these are interesting numbers, but how are they practical? How do they give us insight into the species-specific genes, because there are going to be some gene changes and gene expression changes between different species. Ultimately, that's kind of how evolution tunes things. Well, one of the things that you can get from a, every time I see this, I think how ugly the naked mole rat is. Um, so whenever you sequence a new genome, one of the things that you can immediately get by comparing to lots of other genomes that we've already sequenced is which of the protein coding genes are sped up in their evolution in that specific lineage. All right, this is called um, under positive selection. And the thing is that when you can, you can identify the gene, but you can't identify what enhancers nearby are driving this. Because you only have the genetic sequence, the only genetic sequences that you can compare reliably are the protein coding sequences because they're under much stronger constraint. But if you have 20 species worth of enhancer data, you can try to identify some of the things that matter. So let me give you an example. The TMPO gene is one of them that's been identified as under sped up evolution in naked mole rat. And I'm showing a series of, of bumps here, which in the absence of other species data, you would have no idea how to interpret. Which of these are actually found all the way to, to cow? Which of these are only specific in naked mole rat? Well, when you put human, mouse, cow, and dog underneath it, you can immediately see that the only one that's specific to the naked mole rat is this one right out here. And thus, we are able to identify strong candidates for the lineage-specific regulators that may be helping control the evolution of this gene. And this is true genome-wide. This is not a single isolated example. We find that these lineage-specific enhancers are actually enriched near the genes that are under active evolution in a statistically significant manner. So this is an example with naked mole rat, and just to show you that it generalizes, you can do the same thing with dolphins. So here we have the TRIP12 gene, which is under sped up evolution in the dolphin lineage. And when you compare it to human, mouse, cow, and dog, there's your species-specific enhancer. So, in summary, the results that I've just shown you are that most enhancers actually are very recently evolved, um, and that mapping of enhancers can suggest pathways of evolution. More generally, it's important to point out that these, understanding which of these enhancers are human-specific will have potentially very strong effects on how we understand the human genome because of their species specificity. And it also could serve as a replacement for trying to understand the conserved regions, which is what everyone is currently looking at. So in the future, my lab is continuing to work on this kind of problem. We're testing which candidate regions are functional using new genetic modification techniques, um, which I expect will probably be the subject of Crick lectures far into the future for other awardees. Um, 
we're profiling other tissues, um, liver does give a limited insight. It's only one tissue. Ideally, we'd like to be able to compare between tissues as well as between species. Um, and as I said, we hope that our under new understanding that this has led us to will help to shape the future field of genetic medicine, however um, modestly. So um, I'd like to thank Paul Fleechik's lab and my own lab. Um, we work in very close collaboration as a combined experimental computational uh, front to understand these particular questions. Um, the Copenhagen Zoo, the Cetacean Stranding Investigation Program, and the Zoological Society of London have provided us with tissues, um, as has the University of Cambridge Department of Veter Veterinary Medicine. Um, and I'd like to thank the Royal Society again for this uh, award. And um, these are the folks that fund us, as does Cancer Research UK, and I'm at the Cambridge Institute. Now, last year, Matt Hurls ended his Crick Lecture um, with a recommendation to the audience. Um, and his was that young men should freeze their sperm because mutations uh, accumulate over age, which is a reasonable suggestion. Um, and it's rare that a scientist actually has a forum for, for asking for help. And I'm going to ask you for help now. I want to remind you that humanity, humanity is an asteroid. Humanity is our planet's sixth extinction event. These are species that we will never see again. The dodo, the quanga, the woolly mammoth, the passenger pigeon, the great auk. These are species that in some cases we know the date that the last animal was killed or died in our hands. We are responsible for these. In some cases it was our predecessors as ancestors, but nevertheless. These species are still present in Europe, but they've been extinguished from the UK. And there's hope on occasion. We've Recently, re, are we, the British government has recently reintroduced beavers to the West Country. So this is helpful, but it's, it's not enough. Um, in the last two days, I've been looking around, and I found this horrifying article. DNA analysis suggests whale meat from uh, blah, blah, blah. No other known source of says whales. Japan is still hunting these animals, as is a couple of other countries, including Norway. And bushmeat, which is basically wild animals that have been killed in the jungle, is, is quite widely consumed in not just Africa, but a lot of the uh, tropical parts of the planet. We kind of have to stop doing this, because there's too many of us. Um, we really should ban all whaling. We really should ban the trade in bushmeat and endangered species. And we really should protect habitats more greatly. Now, after I made this slide, I opened up BBC this morning, and what did I find? Now, this is all you know, touchy-feely, oh, we should do this. But I have something specific that you can help with. What can you do right here, right now? There is a proposal that um, the Wildlife Trust is presented to the British government, and it was announced yesterday, um, to create protected marine environments like this around Britain. Now, that is not a huge amount of the coastline. Is this so much to ask? But there's, I understand the resistance. There's an economic resistance to doing this. But if we want these creatures to survive so that we can understand the power and potential of the genome, we need to do something. So if you're interested in helping, you can go to this website, and they have a, a petition you can sign, and any help would be appreciated. That's it. I think I'm on time. And thank you for your attention. Now, after such provocation, I'm sure there are lots of questions. I'll take them two at once. That'll help the people with the microphones. So one <coughs> at the front here. And one, two rows behind, again, on the left-hand side. Maybe they've gone out. 
Ewan, you can just crank it up. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good um, idea. So I thought that was, that was great. I was wondering um, which mammal had the weirdest liver? Uh, uh, from the perspective I didn't taste them. Which mammal had the weirdest liver? Uh, from a molecular, from an enhancer perspective, and does it correlate at all? Uh, so, which ma mammal had the most species-specific enhancer kind of uh, behavior, and does it correlate at all with anything that we know about that mammal's liver? It was surprisingly even. When you looked at the numbers, they were the, there was one or two species where we were only able to get a single replicate. Like says whale, we only had one. Yeah, it was says whale. We only had one replicate. And we had some jag. Sorry, I'm going to be technical for a second. There was some jaggedness in the data because there's a. It wasn't really a fully assembled genome. We had to map it back to dolphin and so on. But um, that was the only one that was really aberrant in terms of numbers. And I don't think it was real. I think it was just because we don't have a good genome. Most of them are very similar in their number of lineage specific enhancers. So the second, excuse me, the second question. It, I. Uh, what we find is that the lineage-specific ones actually cluster near positively selected genes. So that kind of does answer your second question. So it's not that there's more of them. It's that the, that the clustering is specific to each species, perhaps. Yes? Hi, Duncan. It's great to see you up there on the stage. Hi. I was going to ask you, how often do enhanced move relative to how often they disappear at different at genes between species? Uh, move versus, well, I'm not quite sure how to answer that because move means that it's disappeared from one spot. All that you're doing is saying, okay, within this window, there's another one which may or may not recover its function. Um, it depends on how big, I hate to say it depends, but it depends on how big your window is. It depends, and you're also collapsing, you're making an assumption about the functional conservation as well. Um, now, having said that, if you take a 10 kilobase window, uh, depending on how you, you handle it, it's probably under half, just under half of them have a nearby binding event or uh, enhancer in a, another species that's about 80 million years away. But that's, you know, it, it depends from species to species and each individual case is different. Sorry to be a little bit squishy on that answer. Trump. For the rapidly it's on rapidly evolving genes. Uh, one could imagine that they might change quickly uh, either at one extreme because there's very strong selection for the preservation of change, or on the other hand, it might be because there's a mechanism which makes those genes change more quickly. Yes. Can you distinguish between them? Okay. So it, let me try and ref restate your question to make sure that I understood it. So there might be a pressure for them to change quickly is one suggestion. The other, so the other possibility is that, that many of them are either functionally neutral or functionally redundant enough that they're dispensable. So that's the other alternative. I am, I'm inclined to believe the other alternative, by the way. Um, now the second part of the question was, was whether those genes are in some way more highly mutable per se. Got it. Um, the enhancers are certainly more mutable because they are mutating. Um, but the nearby genes, um, I don't know that we've looked specifically for, for that effect because what, what our first experiments have not combined gene expression data in all 20 species. And that would be required to answer that question thoroughly. Does that make sense? Now what, what we have done is taken human and mouse gene expression that's available from the literature and um, asked whether uh, uh, whether genes which only have rapidly evolving promoters are more stable or less stable in their gene expression. I'm sorry, wait. Whether they're more highly expressed or less highly expressed than ones that don't have enhancers or ones that have highly expressed enhancers, uh, highly conserved enhancers. That was it. Um, and it turns out that they're between the two. So they're more highly ex much more highly expressed than, than genes with nothing, but they're lower expressed than ones that have conserved enhancers. Um, yeah, we're just really starting the, a lot of the detailed analyses right now, to be honest. And is, is the extent of expression dictated by the strength of binding of the uh, 
So we to found the enhancer? that well, with with so the enhancer signal is is does not track that way. But um, there's been some speculation that transcription factor binding can can indicate that. We do not find that kind of correlation. Um, lots of reports are out there that say that it does exist, though. I do have to say that that's a point of contention. We have not seen such a clean relationship. Okay. Yeah. Hi. So were there several different placental mammals that survived the asteroid extinction? So the, the ambiguity is that the, a lot of the molecular dating from a genetic basis is a little bit ambiguous because some of the lineages are under hyperaccelerated evolution. Things like mice, their, their rate of evolution is far faster than ours or whales because we have very small population sizes and we're not under nearly as much predation constraint as they are. So it, it can be very difficult to calibrate a molecular clock. That's why I, I did that. There's, there's also some competing theories about this. Th this is actually another area of contention. Um, some folks believe, and there's certainly evidence that supports this as well as the other view, um, that, that, that there were separated radiations a few tens of million years before the asteroid impact. That, that is one hypothesis that there is evidence for. Um, I was simplifying a little bit, and I didn't want to go into too much of the conflict around the, the KT transition. Hi. You seem to imply <clears throat> that this form of genetic change is um, underlying the mammalian radiation, the rapid changes. Um, is there something uniquely mammalian about this form of enhancer um, evolution? Or, I mean, have you compared it to other animal clades or other, or plants even? This is an excellent, excellent question. So, from first principles, you would predict that any species with a relatively small population size would have an evolution pattern like this. Plants, reptiles, things which are big that can't breed too many times quickly. Fish may be in the middle because they can do these really gigantic crosses where they have you know, millions of males and females just dumping gametes together. Um, but I would predict, and I do not have evidence to support this, let me be clear, that, that if you looked at trees or at, um, uh, at reptiles, you would see exactly the same evolution between closely related species. And you can do that because the reptiles also underwent a, a, more, a, slight, a smaller radiation, but nevertheless a radiation after the KT extinction event. I appreciate that it's difficult to get a lot of different cell type samples from a lot of the organisms, but say for a few that we do have a lot of cell types and a lot with sufficient profiling to be able to look at tissue specific enhancers, I was wondering if you get an enrichment of tissue specific enhancers or maybe even super enhancers as well within those 400 conserved uh, enhancers that you see across a binding site event. Right, so I'm not going to rise to that bait. Um, <clears throat> for those who know me, you know what, what I'm saying. Um, we are actively looking for, uh, I'm sorry, we're actively profiling other tissues. Um, the, one of the key questions that we aim to answer with that exper set of experiments um, is to ask how many of these uh, enhancers and, and their conservation status are shared between tissues. Um, and that's entirely unknown. Um, you can look at one species and say, uh, uh, you know, 80% of enhancers are specific to one tissue or another, um, but no one knows whether these are conserved enhancers through evolutionary space or not. And that's one of the questions that we're aiming to answer, hopefully before too many of our competitors can. Yep. Uh, you said this could um, help in the medical field. I was wondering what sort of things it could do in that regard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, so one of the real problems that, that we've run into is that, um, for, let's take, are you familiar with what GWAS studies are? Okay, it's okay. Uh, there's been these huge efforts um, involving sometimes scores to hundreds of labs to try to explore large cohorts of people, humans, to identify genetic variations that are connected or associated with specific diseases, all right? So in other words, if we took this room and 15 of us had diabetes, uh, multiply that by a, a, 
100, right? So you have 30,000 people and 1,500 had diabetes. Maybe we can find genetic signatures in those 1,500 which gave them a slight predilection towards it, all right? And these studies have been very successful in identifying a lot of genetic variants and I should be careful with my words here, and limitedly successful in explaining what these variants do because most of them are in the wilderness away from genes. And so all of a sudden these really quite clever geneticists were like, oh my God, what do we do with these? Well, the first knee-jerk reaction is, are they conserved? Are the underlying sequences conserved? Okay, maybe that's useful. I would predict most of the time it's not. So what other tools do we bring to bear to this? Well, if we know which, which regions are specific to human and therefore need not be conserved at all, those might be better candidates. Now there you're gonna have to tie it into which tissue type you're looking in, which ties into the other question that was asked over here. So that's why I said that this is nascent and we have a lot more work to do. But you can see where it's going if you look at it with that in mind, I think. I don't know anything about the control of transcription using other polymerases. Okay. I mean, it, it is, do you get anything for evolution from looking at uh, where they bind or uh, how they recognize uh, their regions of DNA? Yes, so um, this is a very good question. It's one that um, we explored a few years ago when we, um, we asked, okay, this is gonna be a very technical answer, I'm, I apologize for that. We looked at Paul three binding in mm -hmm. liver from six species and we asked, you know, what's conserved and what's not. And there was a small set. So typically you get about 300-ish tRNAs that are bound in, by Paul three. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the work that we're talking about here is Paul polymer, there's three polymer, okay. There's three polymerases in mammalian systems, one, two, and three. Um, and each has a very specialized function. And most of the work that I've just presented, it, it involves polymerase two driven transcription. Most protein coding genes are polymerase two. Um, and um, Sir, Sir Scale was asking about um, the other two polymerases. And one of them does, it, con it controls and expresses uh, tRNAs, which are the decoders which read those triplet amino acids, just to give everyone context really quickly. Um, what we found was that the tRNAs that are regulated by the Paul 3 um, only about 20 to 30 of those are actually conserved in all six mammals. Most mm -hmm. of them migrate very quickly as well. These are actually mobile elements, turns out. I mean, they're oh. really, sometimes you can find them all the way down the species tree. Oftentimes you can find replicated clusters which are very lineage specific. And we mapped that, and what we found was that the occupancy of Paul 3 when you collapsed it by amino acid type was very highly conserved, even though there was a lot of divergence in the tRNAs that were bound. Sorry. So that was a great question, but maybe so, I'll. Yes. So uh, you gave us a lovely tease about convergent evolution, um, and I'm just wondering, I was hoping that there was gonna be a genetic backstory to it, but you're not really comparing uh, reptiles uh, to, uh, to mammals. I would love to do that experiment. I think my lab would kill me. <laughs> um, no, that's, it, it would be a wonderful experiment. And, but the thing is, um, we can't know what the genetics of the predecessors were. But, but if we preserve them, we might be able to figure out what dictates a blue whale versus a says whale versus an orca. And, and I'm, I'm not saying we're going to do it. My lab, that's probably beyond what I would be able to do in my lifetime. But these approaches are ones that others that come after us should be able to apply. Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> You've been talking about differentiation between species of mammals. Uh, but for evolution to occur um, by natural selection, it must affect, it must select on, on the basis of individuals, not entire species. So, there must be differentiation between the individuals within the species. How does that fit in with your analysis? So I think what you're asking is what is the relationship between inter-individual variation in enhancer deployment versus interspecies species in deployment? This is an excellent question, and it's one of our reviewers asked us that. Um, 
So what we find is that inter-individual variation can, can, you can see up to 15-ish percent variation between individuals, just to, uh, as a rule of thumb. And this is actually pretty standard for the kinds of genomic technologies that we're doing, where if you get different genetic background individuals, even if you get, actually, even if you get clones, like black six mice that were in the same cage, you can get 10 to 15 percent variation between individuals. So that's kind of the, the, the noise scale that we're looking at. Importantly, a lot of those individual specific signals are very low, low level compared to the stuff that's shared between the different individuals. So that gives us more confident that whenever we take a, an intersection of two, that that, that, that that high confidence set is actually higher quality because it's stronger, it's more re reproducible. And whenever you do six, seven, or eight individuals, typically you keep capturing that core set and you get lots of low-level signal in individuals. Um, I, I think that answered part of your question. The interspecies well, comparison, how, how therefore... Does, how does natural selection know? Because it doesn't me measure uh, DNA. Uh, it measures traits and sizes. Absol absolutely. The, so you, most, of, most of the enhancers are quite probably either very redundant or functionally neutral, very often. And so whenever you do have a selective event, you see hard sweeps, but that's very rare, actually. So in human populations, there's only a few that are really solidly nailed down, like, like um, the ability to digest milk is a hard sweep. Um, actually, that's not even really a pure hard sweep. Um, but, but I'm not quite sure how to answer your question, because what you do see is that these, these species are interbreeding enough to keep sort of a, a consensus within the species as to what the core set of enhancers is. Um, that's just, I'm not sure how to answer it beyond that. Is that interbreeding between species, you mean, or between individuals in species? Between individuals in mm -hmm. one species. So that's the origin of evolution, then, is it? Uh, does that account for the whole? Uh, I think that it's an, uh, the, 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 it's the interplay. The, the, the mammalian genome is very large, and our small population sizes means that it's very, very difficult to put hard selective pressure on any one regulatory sequence. That's the key. There's a lot of play, and there's a lot of redundancy. Um, you, can, you can, in a mouse genome, you can delete five million bases, which contain multiple ultra-conserved elements, and nothing happens. The mouse is just like, doo 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 doo. Um, it's, it's amazing. These were magnificent experiments that Eddie Rubin did about eight years ago. Um, our genomes are just very, I have to be careful to select my words here. There's a lot of plasticity in the regulation within our genomes, and I don't think that's fully appreciated. And that's part of the reason that the GWAS hasn't been quite as successful as, as we were hoping in some cases, because some, if, you, if you add up all of the, of the variants that we've been able to link to height, you only explain like, what, what is it, 20 or 25 percent of human height heritability, which is, dude. And they had to, they had to add up hundreds of, of loci to, to get just such a small thing, which means that there's a lot of dark matter that we don't understand in the genome. So. So when we look at uh, the sites for uh, privileged positions around the coast, what will we find? Is the idea that uh, no, no uh, boats are allowed in there that have a, an engine? Uh, what's, what does conservation of the, of the sea mean? Oh. <laughs> I was like, whoa, this is a heavy analogy. Um, <laughs> The regions that, the, that they're advocating essentially limit some of the heavier commercial fishing. Right, and that's it. That, that's really what it boils down to. Right. Well, I think that's it. When, the upstairs, when, when Duncan and I met, I was uh, explaining to him that the selection of him for the Crick Prize winner had nothing to do with me because it occurred before I took this job. All that I can say after this lecture is that I hope the selections that are made while I'm involved a little in the, in the selection stimulate lectures which are, have been so stimulating for all of you as Duncan's tonight. So thank you very thank much. You. That's it.
think we've got to get something. Here we go. Hold on a minute. Hold on. Sorry, I forgot something. <laughs> I, I've done this uh, twice before and forgotten on both occasions. <laughs> so there is a scroll for the prize. There is a, a medal as a memento. And there's a small check uh, to thank Duncan. <laughs> so, thank you. Thank you.